President, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I fully appreciate the last thing you'll want is a very long speech this evening. I will therefore follow the very wise precedent of King Henry VIII, who apparently said to each of his six wives, please don't worry, I don't intend to keep you long. <laughs> I am pleased to be in Oxford. I understand you've been having some problems recently about a certain statue of one Cecil Rhodes. <laughs> Let me just reassure you, the agony that Oxford's been going through is not unprecedented. Uh, some years ago, when I was Foreign Secretary, I went to Mongolia, it's quite true. I had to visit the president of Mongolia, and after they gave up communism, uh, they had adopted Genghis Khan, one of the mass murderers of history, uh, as their national symbol. And when I saw the president, I sat next to him, and between us, there was a large, twice lifetime si life size uh, statue of Genghis Khan. And I said, Mr. President, why have you chosen this man of all people to be your national symbol? He said, Mr. Rifkind, which other Mongolian have you heard of? <laughs> I like, uh, <laughs> I like clearly the whole audience very much uh, was impressed by Anastasia's uh, speech, which we have just heard. I have to say we have one thing in common, Anastasia. It's not that I have been Miss World. I can't make that claim. Uh, but nevertheless, you have been banned from China. I have been banned from Russia, Mr. Putin's Russia. And I wear it as a badge of pride. So clearly, uh, these are matters which we have to look at uh, very, very seriously. Uh, the issue this evening is not whether there are serious human rights abusers in China. Of course there are. There are sadly in many countries human rights abusers. Probably in about half the world it could meet these standards. The issue, and it's a serious issue, is whether instead of indulging in what could be described as gesture politics, whether trade sanctions by the United Kingdom would be even likely, not certain, I don't apply that standard, would be likely to have any impact on the internal policies of the Chinese government, the world's second largest economy, a country whose population is in the billions, and who is very unlikely, if I may dare say it, to pay much attention to a specific set of economic sanctions by an individual country in regard to economic matters. Now, Henry Kitchen, a few moments ago, gave examples of where economic sanctions just haven't worked. And it's worth bearing that in mind before we get carried away with rhetoric. Perhaps the most obvious example, as one Henry mentioned, was that of Cuba. Yes, certainly. I'll happily give away. Proposition doesn't have the burden to say that we have economic sanctions, but that when trade evidently causes human rights abuses in the form of extortion and imprisonment simply because of the presence of foreign trade, we say we limit these companies from trading and causing these direct abuses, oh, sure. and at the very least, the marginal benefit. Uh, I, I, the, this evening, we are not debating whether you have sanctions against a particular company that behaves in an unacceptable way. I don't doubt that a company itself will be very vulnerable to sanctions applied by a country like the United Kingdom, because a company would find it had a severe impact uh, on its international economic position. But frankly, China is not a company. It's a huge country with a massive economy, and that is what you have to bear in mind. Now, the United States tried to destroy tiny Cuba, Castro's Cuba, and imposed economic sanctions right through from 1959 to President Obama a few months ago. And not only did it fail, not only did it not improve human rights in Cuba, but Castro used it as the excuse for the economic incompetence of his own regime. And that is sadly what goes along with gesture politics of that kind. Now, it's not been mentioned this evening, but someone might want to mention what might seem a very different example, the example of Iran. Surely it will be argued that it is sanctions that brought Iran to the negotiating table. And let me explain why I say yes, I, I happily concede that. But it's a different kind of sanctions for a different kind of purpose imposed by different people. And let me explain the significance of this. If you have a country which is deemed by the United Nations Security Council to be a threat to international security, and if you wish to avoid going to war with all the horrors that war involves, then if you can get sufficient international agreement, then sanctions can make a difference. And what has happened with Iran is because not just Britain, not just the United States or France, but Russia and China endorsed the sanctions because they were universal sanctions, because they were not aimed at the internal human rights of Iran, but were actually relevant 
to the threat that its nuclear program was deemed to face. Then we got a degree of support uh, that enabled us to have real leverage. But what we're discussing is not that this evening. There's not the slightest possibility of the Security Council, or indeed the vast majority of countries, being prepared to support economic sanctions against China. So the question is whether the United Kingdom should make a difference. Now, I have no problem with criticizing publicly, and I did not have a problem when I was a minister, when I was foreign secretary. I welcomed the Dalai Lama to my residence in London, against the advice of my officials, because I thought it was right to show support for the hugely courageous stand he has taken over many years. And I've publicly called for China and the Chinese government if they can live with two systems in one country, allowing Hong Kong and possibly Taiwan, if it ever joined China, to continue to have a democratic system of government, why can they not allow Tibet to have freedom and autonomy within China in a meaningful sense? So criticism of China I find very straightforward and very ethically necessary. Again, that's not what we're discussing this evening. We're talking about whether sanctions are the way to make change in China. And in the remaining couple of minutes that I have, let me just simply say this that China is already changing, more slowly than I would like. But it's changing for the reasons that all dictatorships increasingly move over the years to democratic government and a respect for human rights. China today is infinitely different from the barbarism of Mao Zedong. It's a much more open society, with, which allows its own people much greater freedom than they then enjoyed. But what is making the difference is what made the transformation in the other dictatorships in the Far East. Think of South Korea, for many years a military dictatorship. Think of the Philippines, a dictatorship. Indonesia, a dictatorship. Taiwan, a dictatorship. All of which now are countries with substantial democratic systems and a much greater respect for human rights. Not because of economic sanctions, but because their own people within the country demanded that change as they did in Latin America that used to be generalissimos and military dictators in every country. So that is the way we will get change. Give support, by all means, to those within those countries that are fighting for change, because they are the people who will achieve it. Already the Chinese middle class have forced the Chinese government to recognize the evil of, uh, that is done to all the basic rights, not just political rights, uh, by the pollution that was ignored by the Chinese government in its dash for economic growth. And the final point I want to make is about what was mentioned by Anastasia, the rule of law. She's right. That is the crucial way in which you get respect for human rights. The final thing I did, I was involved in the negotiations in the last year, last couple of years, before Hong Kong returned to China. And I remember vividly the discussions I had with the then Chinese Foreign Minister Chen Shi Chen in Beijing as well as in London. And on one occasion I said to him, you know, Mr. Foreign Minister, what you must appreciate in regard to Hong Kong is that what the people of Hong Kong want when they become part of China it's not just to continue having more than one political party to vote for. It is to continue to enjoy the rule of law, which they have indeed enjoyed under British government. And I knew, and I think most people in this room will know, what I meant by the rule of law. But I've never forgotten his answer. He said, oh, don't worry, Mr. Rifkind. We in China, we too believe in the rule of law. In China, the people must obey the law. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, now hold on a moment. When we talk about the rule of law, it's not just the people who must obey it, it's the government that must be under the law, prepared to change its policy when the law requires them to do so, coming from independent judges and independent judiciary. So these, and this is my final point, these are the real motors that create internal change in a society. Not gesture politics by an odd economic sanction by the United Kingdom or by some other country in another part of the world. That makes us feel good. It gives us good headlines. It's done for genuine ethical reasons. I'm not suggesting it's not done for the best of motives. But it's not going to make an iota of difference to a country the size of China. But when the Chinese middle classes themselves, becoming more prosperous, becoming more articulate, becoming more determined to control their own lives, that's what has already happened. This is not just theory or a hypothesis. It's what happened in South Korea. It's what happened with Chinese people in Taiwan. It's what's happened in Indonesia. It's what happened in other parts of the world. Then we get human rights respect. And that is the way the world changes into a better place for the people of China in a way that we've enjoyed and most of the Western world takes for granted. Thank you very much.